This week on the podcast, Frederick is joined by Anton Lorimer and Alistair Jolly, the creatives behind the soon-to-be-released Mobilizing for Monuments road trip video. This is Twitter. All right, folks, welcome back to This Week in Photo. I am your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Today on the show, have my co-host here, but in a different capacity, Mr. Uh, Alistair Jolly is sitting here with his partner in crime from another part of the business, Anton Lorimer, who's our kind of superhero producer, video editor guy. So we're going to we're going to talk about this M4M project or Mobilizing for Monuments project that they pulled together. Um, we've talked about it before, but I want to talk about it from the standpoint of just the, the nerdness of it, like the gear, the tech, the trials and tribulations, the learnings. Would you do it again? All that stuff. So, guys, welcome to the show. How's it going? Hey, hey Frederick. Frederick. Yeah. Yeah, you guys are old hats on the show. I feel like I don't need to introduce you. But if you want to be introduced to these guys, just look in the, the show notes for this episode. You'll see their bio and links to all their stuff and all that. But uh, just real quick, let, let's just set the stage. Anton, you, we all, all three of us are employed by you know the same company. Your responsibilities at the company are video, right? And storytelling for Smug Mug Films, et cetera. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, my sole job at smug mug flicker and ultimately awesome right is basically to produce videos and film you know whether that's documentaries like this m4m project or uh vignettes on photographers uh, promos for flicker smug mug so yeah all my time 100 percent of my time is i'm either in pre-production or post-production of any one project or multiple that's cool so, yeah that's cool and then you you and alistair work alistair you guys work uh, kind of in lockstep um, with you being more on the logistical side and, and all that. Can you kind of explain how you guys you guys work together? Yeah, I, I mean, I work on the, the production side, so helping produce the content, you know, by, you know, finding uh, artists, working on logistics, working on, you know, on days of the shoot, making sure Anton has everything he needs and making sure things are going in the background while Anton's doing the, the creative stuff on the ground. Yeah, and together, the super friends, Making magic right? or Wonder Twins. Yeah, yeah Wonder Twins. <laughs> Wonder Twins. <laughs> cool. So we're gathered here today to talk about this M4M project or Mobilizing for Monuments project that you guys were involved in, uh, which was which was kind of incredible. And I'm jealous because you guys got to drive in Rivians through all these amazing looking vistas and all that. Let's start there. So, so Alistair, what was the what was the purpose? of this trip, right? Just set the stage for people that may not have heard about it. Yeah, uh, we've, we've spoke about this on the show before, so I'll, I'll yep. condense it as much as possible. Smug yep. Mug and Flickr were b both members of the Conservation Alliance, as are Rivian. Uh, and together we decided that in order to uh, create, you know, do a cool project together, Rivian and Flickr, together with the TC, decided we would go on a road trip and we would visit five locations across the US, visiting uh, areas that had been designated as national monuments, so they therefore had some protection, uh, visiting some areas that needed to be designated, so trying to highlight that these really incredible places had no protection and advocating for them to become national monuments. And we visited a, a couple of monuments that were looking to try and get expanded to make the, the area protected even bigger. So we went on this road trip with the Rivian vehicles, uh, Anton, myself, uh, some colleagues from the Conservation Alliance and Rivian, uh, and our COO, Ben McCaskill, to you know showcase the beauty through photography and film of these areas that we were visiting. Very cool. Very cool. And uh, mission successful, I'm assuming? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it was <laughs> definitely definitely a mission. Uh, you know, Anton and I, we kind of got parachuted in quite late to the project. Uh, you know, Anton and I would always say that we would like, you know, to have been in there much earlier to try and help produce it. So we got you know, kind of parachuted in late and yeah, we had to, we, you know, we had to make uh, magic uh, happen with a very, very tight schedule uh, traveling across the US from 
uh, Denver to to California. Yeah. You know? That what I, I gotta ask. What, what does the loadout for something like this look like? Like the gear, like for both of you, like. I can't imagine. I feel like it's, it's space is restricted because you're not the only ones in the car. You can't bring the kitchen sink, but you got a job to do. It feels very military. Like what, what was the what was the gear situation? Uh, well, my gear situation is usually <clears throat> it's probably it's condensed and it's rendered down to what one person can carry through an airport. So. Yeah. I'm always kind of like light and run and gun anyway. So I just brought my normal kit. Um, I knew I was kind of worried about this project. Well, for many re reasons. I mean, as uh, Alistair mentioned, we were kind of, we showed up to this party when the ball was already in motion, right? So um, usually I have control over every project from start to finish. This one we kind of parachuted in mid pre-production and we were kind of given this task and we knew it was across a broad expanse of you know the western u.s limited time um, and many many players and many stories right and so i did go lighter than i typically do i guess because i knew i had to kind of run and gun most of it you know um, but that's that said it's i usually go with two cameras and a couple drones and maybe a gopro especially if we're traveling by truck and i think we had a uh, Insta360 with us too. I was going to ask about that. You're shooting 360 as well. Yeah. Yeah. Did that yeah. come into play? Did you use any of that footage? Because my experience is it's oh, yeah. nice, but it's, it's, a little it's bit. soft, you know? I don't yeah. Know. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't, depending on the film we're creating, you know, it, it just doesn't look very cinematic typically, right. in my opinion. Yeah. But I think with the road trip, that road trip feel, you stick the pole out of the Rivian and you're driving across a dirt road. There are, there are instances where it's a little bit more forgiving. The viewers thinking, okay, it's obviously Insta360. This, the shot is a little or different GoPro. than everything I'm watching. Or a GoPro, yeah. right? So I feel like in these documentaries, there's room for that kind of less cinematic look. But you really want to you know, bring in the environment. And that's one of the great things about a GoPro and these 360s, which is they're super wide. I mean, in yeah. fact, the 360 is as wide as you can get, right? And so you can really right. pull the viewer into the environment. So yeah. I, use it. I use anything I can whenever I feel like it. You know, yeah. no, we, and that's Anton, the beauty. Of it. Oh, go ahead. So Anton had, Anton had all the film gear. I, you know, while I'm on the road or creating content for social, you know, capturing behind the scenes, uh, imagery and content. Uh, and I had the latest rig of all because I did it on this trip. I did it all on the iPhone. Uh, all the social content, all you know, video for for reels, uh, all the B BTS was all captured on the iPhone 15. So I had a very very light rig. Uh, I took a little gimbal with me as well for the for the phone. But yeah, it was quite fun tra but traveling you know so light. What was that decision process like? Like the night before you had to get on the plane and it, there was no turning back. I always it, like you didn't you didn't feel like you know well maybe I'll just bring you know, a proper camera. Maybe I was bring the Fuji just as a backup. You never had any of that? We had, that? We had a bunch of a bunch of real cameras, let's say real, yeah. uh, because, you know, the people on the trip were taking a lot of uh, photography. So we had a, a whole bunch of Fujifilm gears. We even had GFX on, on, the, on the trip with us. So yeah, we had a whole bunch of proper mirrorless cameras, if you want to say proper. So yeah. We had that kind of backup, but you know, I'd been shooting with iPhone 15 for a little while. I, I knew how incredible the stabilization was on it, that type of thing. So for social, it was really a no-brainer, you know. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's a, that's exciting. So was it all you dreamt it? Both of you guys, was it all you dreamt it would be? I mean, who doesn't want to drive across the, you know, the the rural Western United States in an electric vehicle? You know, provided you can find a charger, I'm guessing, but. You know. No, was that was one of the we'll get to that. That, was a, that was a huge <laughs> hurdle. But yeah, the logistics of it. I'm just glad, you know, when I go on a shoot, I want to take it in. I want to think about where I am and be appreciative of, you know, what I do, I guess. But while you're on a project, I'm just so like focused and like tunnel vision. It's all I think yeah. about. And then I come back and I edit it. 
and then I, I I look back and think, wow, that was amazing. But during, you know, you're just thinking, I hope we get to this location before the sun sets. I hope we charge these Rivians up so we could leave in the morning at the time we yeah. need to, because yeah. we have four more locations in four days, you know. But um, it was beautiful, and it was like, and the people along the way, the team that we had, um, everyone was super cool, and they made it really fun. So yeah it was well at the end of it it felt like you know the end of summer camp you know so yeah you gotta say trip. goodbye yeah there was yeah. yeah there was definitely people on the trip had way better time than anton and i because we were you know we were getting up at 4 a.m to start traveling and filming you know anton was having to back up late into the night make sure stuff's downloaded backed up make sure batteries are charged you know so it was you know seven super long days for us but it was exceptionally good fun yeah it was we saw some of the most incredible parts of the u.s uh with a great team uh we saw some beautiful sunsets sunrises um got to meet incredible people grassroots people on the ground working for some of these grassroots organizations who you know spend their entire life advocating for the protection of the lands that they in many cases live on yeah. So, um, yeah, that was a real highlight was the people that we met along the way. So it did feel, yeah, as you say, Anton, kind of end of summer camp uh, when we got to got to the end um, and lots of lots of great memories along the way. But it was exhausting. <laughs> it really, was. You know, I wonder about that. And you guys with the again, if I if I brushed over it in the beginning, um, you guys are the, the force behind Smug Mug Films, which is just a. a a list of just amazing productions. If people haven't seen it, we'll link to it in the, the show notes in the description for this video. But it, the films are amazing, right? And whenever I look at those, I'm looking at them from like a photographer standpoint, it, it feels a little bit tragic, right? Because I feel like these guys get to travel to all these amazing places and work. <laughs> you guys, you get to, like, do you ever feel like you haven't been to a place because you've been so much running and gunning trying to get all the, the assets for the story and then get to the plane and get out of there? You're like, where were we? Madagascar? Oh, okay. You know, is ever like that? <laughs> uh, from time to time. I think I could go to Madagascar and remember that one, but um, <laughs> from time to singing, time. Yeah, singing you lemur. Like <laughs> but I honestly, I absolutely, even on our toughest days, uh, the longest days, regardless of how tired we get, I am very appreciative of the fact that the office is somewhere out there part of the time. And I get to, yeah. I always say one of the greatest things about this job is I get to be a kid once in a while, you know, whether that's yeah. getting up before the sun comes up or hanging out of a car or a boat or, you know, talking with people walking across the desert or something like that. I mean, that's just amazing and i never forget that part of it although the other 85 percent of my time is sitting behind a computer and editing everything we capture but um yeah, yeah i love it you know you know or alistair you mentioned earlier that you only brought quote only brought an iphone which i'm guessing is you know a relatively recent iphone which is highly capable for something like this do you do you, Anton, do you ever, you ever, or both of you guys, do you ever think of just like, okay, we're going to standardize on mobile now that it's kind of oh. there for the most part. Do you ever decide, you ever think about just getting rid of all project. the big stuff? Yeah, Are you yeah. talking about what we deliver or what we actually film on? What I mean, you film on? I, what you film uh, on? I, yeah. I love, I've never, I've, I've never shot a project on an iPhone, but I do fantasize about it. I mean, honestly. I, I wish I could just have three iPhones just max out with memory and travel through an airport with just that. I mean, I, I, there's something to be said about using one tool, right? Yeah. And squeezing the creativity out of that. Um, I think we did a documentary on a street photographer named Alan Schaller, and, and he suggested that for, for photography or street photography where you go out and use one lens, one fixed lens. Yeah, and yeah then instead of all these choices, you start to think about what you can capture with uh, a lesser tool. Not that the iPhone's lesser, but I mean, and it's quite capable, but uh, I love the idea of taking yeah, it. Yeah, we've spoke about it. Shoot on my phone. Yeah. We've spoke about it at length of, of just creating content on iPhones for a project. Um, and ideally, probably with someone who uses an iPhone or a mobile device to for their creativity. So yeah, if there's anybody out there that's an incredible iPhone photographer, we'd definitely like to speak to them about a project. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, I would think that it, it it feels fairly 
Occam's razor, right? Because especially with uh, with USB-C on the latest iPhones and the ability to use external storage devices and record ProRes directly mm -hmm. to an external device now. Yeah. I mean, you don't even have to worry about getting the latest and greatest, you know, high capacity phone. You just plug in That's your true. thing and, and go. So I wonder, yeah. I wonder what the what the limit like. What's holding you guys back from doing that? Is it just you know, we've always done it this way and we can produce a work product that everyone knows and is happy with, with the gear that we have now. So don't want to rock the boat or is there some limitation that is stopping I, you? I guess I would have to go and, and shoot like a suit, like a, like a pseudo project or something and find out what the, my only thing that's stopping me is what's the work or what's the workload or the work, the what am I losing? The, workflow. Like, yeah, workflow. I mean, what's the yeah. workflow in, in, in post production, and what am I losing in terms of like quality? Yeah. I mean, there's so yeah. much done in the iPhone, which I like, but I like the leeway of shooting raw, right? So that's yeah. my only real. No, it's the only thing that's really stopping me. I wonder if I wonder if you guys could get to a get to a point where you're shooting on, uh, like you said, Anton, you got three iPhones and you're doing all the things with the iPhones, but then you're also editing on an iPad in Final Cut. And when, you know, so now your entire gear fits, <laughs> fits into like a shoulder bag or something, you Absolutely. know, everything for the whole production. Yeah, I mean, what if a Apple really focused on making a cinema camera that was just twice the you know functionality of an iphone it wouldn't have to be that much more or yeah. you know just having the functionality of this screen on you know cameras yeah um it's so intuitive you know yeah, yeah. I, I something tells me that along with the computational stuff that it does right exactly yeah i was gonna say something tells me that that's not the direction that the company's pointing in right now is to right. make life better for professional photographers i think we're kind of like a yeah, a rounding <laughs> error in the grand scheme of profits over there. <laughs> so, Indeed. Yeah. yeah. So, so in, in terms of uh, impact, you know, environmental impact of this project, the, Alistair, you said success, right? The project itself was a success from a, okay, we got the video done and everybody loves it. I've heard, I've heard nothing but positivity about the final product, which people will see soon. But, uh, you know, has the the Uber sort of goal of this project been achieved, i.e. awareness and movement in Washington, et cetera? It's, there, it's certainly started. We, mm -hmm. um, you know, we've made a, a great film that we can't wait for everybody to see because we want to impact the world with this, this film. But it did have a specific goal uh, when we created this uh, with the Conservation Alliance is that, you know, First and foremost, we wanted to speak to, you know, the, the Congress and you know, yeah. you know, the the people in power within the U.S. Um, so the film has already been um, shown uh, at the White House uh, to some representatives and some other people, and has already, um, you know, made made a statement to these people. It's already had a, you know an impact on people's thoughts about the importance to make these places, uh, you know, national monuments to protect them. Um, some of the, the areas that we showcase in the film were recently designated just before we went and filmed there. So, you know, there's one, uh, one area called uh, Marble Canyon that, you know, had over 10,000 licenses to go mine on that area. And after it became designated as a monument, there's only one license left in that entire area. So um, having these you know, areas designated has a huge impact. We've already started that process of advocating it and having key personnel within uh, Washington, D.C. kind of see the, the film and see the importance of it. We've also shown it to, um, you know, some some other organizations that help raise money for uh, grants for these kind of grassroots organizations, and they've been hugely impacted by the film already. So we're, we're gearing up to its general release, release, and once it's on general release, we hope that it has a much wider impact. But, you know, we're already happy with the impact that it's having to that, you know, th those people in Congress that ultimately we made the film to, to try and, you know, convince uh to to sign certain papers you know yeah is this you, do you feel like this is a one and done or is this the first of many anton 
Well, I mean, I think with the direction of, I know what we want to do as a company and make an impact on the world around us, I, I definitely think that we'll be doing more kind of philanthropic stuff like this. So yeah, yeah. I look forward yeah. to that. We, yeah. yeah, we could, you know, we certainly be, we'll be working with our partners at the Conservation Alliance. You know, we're proud members of the Conservation Alliance. So we'll definitely be looking at other projects. Um, we've already got some that we're thinking of, but I, even even the the film that we've already made, I think there's opportunities for us maybe to look at you know other edits of it. Um, I don't know, Anton and I. I know we both feel the same way. You know, we had this this road trip where we spent seven days on the road. Anton and I could easily have spent those seven days in one location. The, these mm -hmm. locations were absolutely phenomenal. So, you know, there is maybe even more scope to make a bigger piece about each of those areas that we we highlight in the in the film. Um, or even some of the organizations that we film. Uh, so yeah, there's there's maybe too many opportunities and too much, yeah. you know, which is a is a sad thing that we have to keep, you know, we have to tell these stories, you know, to, to try and get these places protected. It's, they should speak for themselves, but hopefully by creating these films and showcasing them and showing them in film and photography, that that has the impact of letting people see just how beautiful they are and why they should be protected. Yeah, I love that. I love that. So before we end this, we're coming to a close here. This went quick, but I want to, I want to talk about the electric vehicle part of this. <laughs> right? You mentioned yeah. we mentioned chargers. You guys mentioned there may have been a little bit of stress involved with traveling traveling across deserts with in electric vehicles. How did it work? Yeah, what didn't work? What worked? This project had a lot more people involved, right, from the beginning, and and a good number of people on the road trip. I think. I don't know how many people did we have 16, 16, something, 16 yeah. people oh, geez, wow. yeah. um so that's a lot of just logistics in you know hotel rooms getting up in the morning figuring out where to eat lunch or dinner and then you add into the equation the electric vehicle thing which the rivians were amazing um but we are traveling through a part of the country that just it's just a dark area for chargers you know yeah. uh you get to like four corners or monument valley you're just looking in you know 50 mile directions in either way and when you get to these locations are they trickle chargers do they you know is it going to take 60 or, <laughs> or are they broken you know so mm -hmm. alistair worked really closely and a lot of logistics were done prior to leaving on the trip obviously what's our route and that you know where we charged and how fast it would be really dictated our path through this through the week because we'd have to say, okay, we love this location. We'd love to drive 25 miles south because there's a second location that we'd like to shoot before the sun sets, but we'd have to calculate our mileage and say, okay, if we do that though, are we going to be able to get to the hotel tonight? And sometimes uh, that was a no, you know? So definitely, uh, I don't, I don't want a hurdle, I guess, you know, but it, yeah. it all worked out and Alistair can speak more to it. He's a huge Rivian fan on top of this. He got to, he drove <laughs> the Rivian a bit and, um, uh, he did a lot of work on making sure that the logistics matched up with the production, you know, because there'd be times where they'd say, okay, then we got to leave at four o'clock so that we can go charge. And we thought uh, four o'clock is, that's the perfect time to shoot. So how do we do this? You know? Yeah. It's interesting coming in from the logistics from, you know, the, the creative side where you're looking for the best light. Um, you know, at certain times of the day you want to film, those are the best times of day, but that's also when the, other people consider that's the best time to eat and charge. You know? So you have a different you have a different mindset as a creative, right, compared to most people. So when they look at traveling, when we looked at the travel plan for the seven days, you know, yeah, it's very easy to get from point A to point B and charge. But then there's no time to actually do anything creative. There's no time for interviews. There's no time to film, or it's dark. So yeah. we had to we had to come in and shake up the whole schedule a little bit to make sure that we got. The important bit which which was showcasing these places at their best like we want to mm -hmm. you know showcase just how beautiful they are at the best time of days but we definitely had to make compromises we, there's no way that like north north arizona it's you know it's pretty limited yeah. when it comes to charging <laughs> there so yeah. um how did you and, and it's not it, just though? like what, what was the solution well, every project has its scope right like you mm. want to stay as long as you could possibly could to get everything you could, you know, bring home and create this wonderful piece. But you know, this one had its limitations in, in time and people, you know, yeah. and some days we got everything we wanted and other days we just had to, you know, 
really just dig down deep and get what we could at, for one hour at one location. You know, the number of people that we interviewed for this project, it was like 30, which is far beyond, mm. you know, and every, all 30 people had something real to say, like a real story, um, something significant to say about why they were there. And so you have all these locations with decades of, you know, work to get these places designated. Then you add 30 people in with all the entities that are involved. Um, you know, it was a, from an ending standpoint, it was a total mess. It was like, uh, you know, <laughs> but that's the challenge. I mean, every project has its challenges. And the biggest challenge on this one were, was how do you in 10 minutes or 12 minutes create something where you tell a story about a road trip, you tell a story about history and passion for these locations and culture, and then introduce everybody, all of the entities, the, the people on the ground doing the work and the corporate entities that are, you know, involved in this work as well. Um, the TCA members and stuff. So it, it was a stressful edit, but I'm really happy with kind of what we finished yeah. with in the end. It's amazing. But, yeah. mm. And it's where, it's yeah. where as a creative team, you've also got to remember the brief, right? You've got to remember why yeah. you're there and who you're, who you're creating the content for. Because I can tell you, you know, you know, driving through Monument Valley in the middle of the night is heartbreaking, right? It's one of the most beautiful places in the world, but it's not, it wasn't part of the film. It's not one of the five areas we're going to. So, you know, when you look at the map and you're like, oh, we're going to drive through Monument Valley, we're going to pass Horseshoe Bend, we're going to pass all these iconic places, but it's going to be dark and we're going to be doing it yeah. late at night, early in the morning, right. because they're they're not part of the brief. And, you know, so you have to, you have to remember that. You have to remember why you're there and what and you're like you doing. said, you could, you could spend a career a whole career on this effort, you know, yeah. or like Alistair said, we could have spent all seven days at one location. So you just have to remember that it's a road trip story and not a, Hey, I want to camp out here for four or five days and get to know everybody kind of story. Otherwise it would have been a eight part mini series, you know, <laughs> yeah. so. which is not a bad idea. I mean, you know, no, I'd be up be, for it. <laughs> it could be cool. It is until you remember the brief because you right. know, you've got to remember who's, brief. who are, who are we who are we filming for we're filming for members of congress they don't have eight hours to watch these things right, right. so yeah. you, you have to create a piece, sure. you have to create a piece of content that policymakers are going to be engaged with for the limited time that they have and it has impact and tells the story we need to tell very quickly so you know there's a joke we could have made eight hour episodes yeah but yeah. that's not what the job was so so, so as we, as we, uh, bring this to a close, um, both of you respectively, maybe we'll start with you, Alistair, like the, the, the most impactful, memorable thing that happened on this adventure, whether, um, whether related to photography or just the trip itself, like what, what, what do you say is the biggest thing that sticks in your brain? The most impactful thing for me was seeing some of the most beautiful places in the world and being educated that there was no protection on these pieces mm -hmm. of land. It's kind of hard to comprehend that there are such stunning, important pieces of the world that no protection at all from companies that want to extract things and, you know, that, you know, those type of decisions that can be made that it was kind of shocking, but it was, you know, the, the most impactful thing for me that I learned that there are vast, vast parts of the U S that certainly need protected, uh, need some protection such as national monuments. Yeah. 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 A lot of empty space out there, right? Especially when you're mm -hmm. driving through it at night, nothing like, like the abyss in all directions, except for your headlights. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Anton, what about you? What, what's your key takeaway from this adventure? Uh, I mean, it's kind of along the same lines, though a little different, I guess. Um, like all these projects, there's a little bit of a learning curve. And when I walked into this project, I thought, it's obvious. Like, why wouldn't you want to protect the Grand Canyon and the surrounding areas? Um, yeah. Just based on their history and beauty. But I realized during this trip that their beauty and their history, that's it's not enough. You know, I think what the TCA is doing is right in terms of showing that preserving these places, you can start to slowly build businesses and then communities and ultimately a culture that perpetuates like these micro economies that yeah. 
can keep going based on protection and leveraging these landscapes rather than extracting what's there. And so it can work. It's a win-win. It can be a win-win. Um, and so that was like the big takeaway I had where, you know, you think about roping off an area and you can't use it in any way. Uh, it's beautiful, but it can, it can work with and for people too, you know? Yeah. So yeah, that was the big takeaway for me. So uh, if photographers want to get involved with this effort, M4M, or, you know, just it, it, literally exposing those areas to, to people so they know what's out there, what's the best way? You guys have recommendations on how to, how to engage? Yeah, certainly the first place to visit is the Mobilizing for Monuments uh, website. Uh, a lot of great content on there. I'm sure Frederick will post a link to that in the, in the notes yeah. below. Um, you know, and that, that, website will lead you off to learn more about the Conservation Alliance. If you're, you know, someone who's involved in an outdoor brand that, you know, uses these parts of the world for, you know, its business or for recreation, then I'd recommend maybe advocating to your organization to join the Conservation Alliance. Um, but yeah, Mobilizing for Monuments is the website's probably the best place to start. All right. Well, and I'll link to all this stuff, obviously, from the from the blog post and the the YouTube description. Uh, lastly, both of you guys are, like I mentioned before, the force behind Smug Mug Films. What's next on that list that you can reveal? Like, what are, what is, what's the next film we can look forward to? We can, we'd have to kill you if we told you. No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh, I don't wanna know uh, that bad. <laughs> well, we have stuff coming up, right? We have, I don't know, we might be working with our old astronaut friends Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I heard about that. Yeah. Is that still super secret? You can't talk about it yet? It's it, not. It's, it's, again, it's, it, it, it's we're, we're working on access and getting to the space, uh, space center in Houston. And, you know, but long story short, one of our old documentary, um, uh, you know, photographers, he's going back up to the um, International Space Station in the next, I don't know, six months, maybe less. Mm -hmm. Five months, yeah. And he's going to be up there for a year. I think a year. That's the scheduled amount of yeah, time, which is that's crazy. The, that's the think. plan. Being, yeah. So anyway, um, we're going to shoot that. It's going to be a long one because he doesn't get back from the space station for a year after he launches. But we're going to hopefully we're, we'll start shooting the, the, the start of it, his training and stuff like that. That's so cool. What a great yeah, it's been 10, 10 years since we made the first one with, with Dawn. So um, looking forward to making that one. But like anything it's space space mission wise it's all uh at risk <laughs> so we yeah. say you know from you know for for various things so that that is hopefully the next one we'll be on the road for we're working you know we're looking at other conservation projects as well as our you know projects for our brands that we work with you know obviously smug yeah. mug and flicker so yeah 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 love it very good. Thanks, cool. thanks for doing this, guys, and the quick turn on Pleasure. this. I know I, I literally sprung this on you guys yesterday, and you said yes. So thank you. For, for well, we love talking about this. On... Yeah. Yeah. No, Great it's good stuff. Yeah. People, people we really you. hope people. Yeah, I really hope people enjoy the film. Hope it and get you can engage with it. Um, and you know, when does it premiere? Uh, spread when's spread the, the word. When's the, the, when's the big public review? launches? Eighteenth, eighteenth of April. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yep. 18th of April. I'll link to where that's going to be located. And uh, yeah, we'll tell everybody about it when it's ready for eyeballs. Congratulations, cool. guys. I've seen the film and it, it's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing cool. what you guys did. And knowing, especially after this conversation and knowing all the little details that had to go into it logistically, like just driving a family through that area in electric vehicle without trying to do a documentary you know, a 12 minute long documentary is a challenge. And you guys had 16 people. How many Rivians? Four Rivians? Five. Was it? Five, five Rivians. Yeah. Five at one you time. You know, yeah. you had to build a cohesive story. And not only did you have to build a cohesive story, but that story had to convince and deliver its message. It had to do its job, right? So it wasn't like you could just say, yeah, I'm just going to take some pictures of sunsets and rocks or whatever. You had to get it done. And you did. So, bravo. Congratulations. <laughs> I appreciate it. We appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you, Alistair, for all the help. Uh, you know, Alistair keeps me out of a lot of trouble. So thank you, Alistair. <laughs> I can't Alistair stop him crashing drones, away. though. 
<laughs> well, we oh, yeah. a couple of you trusted yeah i wanted to hear yeah la- yeah send us off with well, this like what what well, equipment did you destroy <laughs> well we had we brought a, a dedicated drone operator also cole um who yeah. was a great help because we knew we had a little bit of time in uh, in these lo- in these beautiful locations so we sh- we crashed one fpv drone uh, but that's kind of normal in that world i think so they bounce you know, no as well so. yeah and then I and then I back drone up into the side of a, a cliff. Yeah, uh, we're in Marble Canyon. No um, object canyon. avoidance sensors on the back of those aircraft. Box right? Canyon. <laughs> well, you know well, what? The, oh, yeah, Box just... Canyon. But it was. But I was yeah. going full speed, and I don't know. I wasn't thinking. I was thinking of oh, this. I don't know. It's been a long time since I crashed a drone, but luckily we were able to retrieve it. It was. I don't know, a hundred feet up on this cliff, which I had to kind of scale this sandstone to get. And it has this beacon. It just, you know, you, you put in this mode and it just starts beeping really loudly. You're just kind of looking for it audibly to, um, and I'm just glad we got to, we got to, you know, grab the drone it was unharmed. And, you know, luck, honestly, it's the footage that you, you fear in, in, in losing when you crash a drone even more than right. the drone itself. Right. But, Turns out when they're in sports mode, going really fast, the reversing uh, sensors turned off. That's what it is. That's what it was. <laughs> I know. I just got a little careless. But you know, if you're not crashing a drone every once in a while, you're not trying. Right. You're not trying hard yeah. enough. Yeah. That's yeah, what they say. That's what they say. So. Cool. All right, guys. We'll leave it right there. Thanks again. Um, Thanks, and Frederick. yeah, all the all the links for all this stuff will be in the show notes and the the YouTube description. I encourage people to head over there, check it out, get involved, and uh, yeah, marvel at this film when you see it. It's it's pretty it's pretty dang amazing what you you guys are able to pull off. So very good. Thanks. We'll leave it right there. Enjoy the film, everyone. Thanks, Frederick. Yeah. Take right. care, guys. This is Twitter.